join me in welcoming to the stage Tarun Tejpal and Manu Joseph for the alchemy of writing. And please do turn off your mobile phones now so that they don't interrupt the session. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Manu Joseph, and he's Tarun. There's any doubt. Uh, uh, there was a time in my life when I was uh, uh, one level lower than a struggling writer. I was a struggling journalist. Uh, and uh, I got my first break when I was hired by the Outlook magazine, and Tarun Tejpal hired me, actually. Uh, he, had, uh, he had interviewed three people, uh, and uh, as a South Indian, uh, I thought the best way to deal with North Indians is to just let them talk about themselves. Uh, <clears throat> I thought that would be my strategy. Uh, but Tarun turned out to be a very sharp person. He asked a lot of deep questions. He interviewed uh, two other people. Then he told some colleagues, uh, all three are duds. <laughs> uh, what do we do? Uh, but somehow they convinced him to hire me. And uh, I really, I mean, I got lucky, I think. <clears throat> Tarun by then uh, was already a very famous writer. He is one of the most beautiful uh, feature writers uh, the country has. <clears throat> and uh, he presided over one of the most important print uh, uh, journalism stories of India, which is the expose of uh, the nexus between bookies and the cricket establishment. Tarun's role is extremely important here because uh, in our country, Editors are usually in competition with their own writers. But Tarun as an editor always had the confidence in himself not to fall into that trap. And he developed uh, people like Anurudh Behel and many others who are extremely successful journalists right now. So Tarun's contribution, his greatest contribution is actually invisible. The kind of people he has promoted and in a way let loose into the world. <coughs> After Outlook, uh, he started the Helka, uh, where they follow the cricket betting story. Uh, and uh, then they exposed an extraordinary story, which is Operation West End, where we saw Bangaru Lakshman uh, accepting one lakh. And uh, it actually entered the cultural realm of the country. Actually, uh, among the bookies, you may not know, uh, for some time, uh, rupees 1 lakh came to be called One Bangaru actually, after that. Uh, <clears throat> but that story also almost destroyed Tarun. Uh, the, the Tarun is a man who knows what happens when your own government gets after you. And the person who's sitting here in front of you, he's someone who knows the importance of human rights and the activists who support human rights in this country. <clears throat> Um, most of us know that he has also written The Alchemy of Desire and uh, The Story of My Assassins. There is a moment in uh, The Story of Assassins which I want to read out, <coughs> which is very interesting because uh, it's very disturbing. It's disturbing because of its accuracy. On the one hand, we have uh, scumbags who use practicality, which is, I think, the most overrated quality of our times, to do what they want to do. <coughs> Uh, then you feel that a person like Tarun would support the nice guys, the good guys. But this is what he has to say. <clears throat> the men of the world understood that moral niceties, the rituals of honorable conduct, were for the feeble of heart. The men who were nice were the men who were afraid. Afraid of being snubbed. Afraid of being alone. Afraid of the reflection in the mirror. They were nice because they were afraid to be unnice. They were nice in the desperate hope that other men would also be nice to them. But Kapoor Saab, who's, who's an arms dealer, was not such a man. He was a man who was not afraid to be unnice. He understood that the central principle of everything was neither decency, nor ethics, nor money, nor love, nor religion. It was power and its acquiring and welding. And wielding, sorry. He understood that it was good to keep the men around you in continual fear. It made them into nice men, afraid men. What's smoothest, 
when it ran through a forest of frightened men. <coughs> so Tarun, uh, on the one hand, we have the powerful men. On the other hand, <coughs> uh, at the other end of the spectrum, are men who are nice because they are cowards. So what do we do? Well, I think sort of, uh, uh, if, you, if you're asking me as a writer and a novelist, uh, both the passage you read, but before I say anything, I must say to, uh, to this wonderful audience here that uh, of all the outstanding uh, colleagues that I've had uh, my, uh, the good fortune to work with and have worked with me, I guess Manu was, will figure right up there because he's gone on to achieve wonderful things. I'm really happy that even though I don't believe, I, I don't think I said uh, all three are duds, that's his story. <laughs> I'm sure I picked him, <laughs> you know, because I remember when he wrote his book, he dropped me a line and he said, I'm right, I've just finished a novel and uh, where do you suggest I send it? And I immediately send it to my own editor with a very strong recommendation saying, I remember him as a fine writer. I'm sure he's written a good book. Give it a good look. So uh, uh, I'll, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll choose to defer on that story. Uh, more importantly, he read a particular passage just now uh, which re related to power, uh, the idea of power and niceness, or powerlessness and niceness, and, and unniceness and power. It's fundamentally a, a meditation of one of the characters in the book. Uh, this is something I just want to make clear because I find very often that when people read my books, they seem to fall into the trap of trying to identify me with the narrator's voice or with other voices in the books. Uh, it's, it's, it's not true. You write a book from a point of view and various characters in the book uh, uh, articulate different points of view. And a good reader can actually always, I believe, see through the various points of view, the various cacophonies in a good novel to understand where the author's true moral center lies. I imagine that anybody reading either of my two novels will understand who fundamentally I'm sympathetic to and where my, where the writer's sympathies lie, though they'll never be evident in the cacophony of voices that are created. The, the, the question that Manu asked was about power. I am fascinated by trying to understand power. I, the 10 years that I've lived with the Hilka, the 10 years that I've been dragged through the belly of the beast, you know, we were swallowed after we broke the big story on arms corruption on March 13th, 2001, we were entirely by, by the beast that is the state. And so we, we are, I, I think it's a, it's a singular fortune of mine as a journalist and a writer that the beast swallowed me. There are very few writers and journalists, at least working in the English language in India, who had the chance to experience what we've had the chance to experience, which is the entrails of the beast. So a lot of the writing that comes out of, or, 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 out of me, or a lot of the journalism that comes out of Tehelka is directly influenced and impacted by having traveled the belly of the beast. Power lies at the heart of all societies. When it's a society like India, a really contested society, a, a country that, in my opinion, is still a work in progress. It's not a finished country, this is not a finished uh, work. This is a work in progress, and this work in progress is today being questioned by a myriad different interest groups and a myriad different voices. In all this, even more than other finished nations, the, the business of power, who gains power, who wields power, how power is wielded, becomes fundamental to every single existence, uh, 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 including each one of us here. So as, 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 as someone who was brought up in a slightly idiotic, rarefied atmosphere of schools and Anglo-Saxon education, it's taken me a long time to understand the true nature of India. And I still struggle with it, let me tell you. And one of the greatest understandings is that the mistake our fathers made was they told us that politics was a bad word. Politics is the most important thing in this country, let me tell you now. Politicians are the single most important animals in this country right now. And it is what they do, how they will behave, that will determine the contours of our lives. It is therefore that much more important that our engagement with politics remains fulsome, aggressive, and interventionist. And, and this is something, as I said, I've had to come to because I was brought up reading these fine books, speaking the fine language of the old colonialists, and imagining politicians as, as, as dislikable characters. Our parents did us a great disservice because just the generations before them had actually engaged in politics in the most comprehensive way to create the idea of India. 
India was created out of politics. Please understand that. I'm constantly trying to struggle with this with my own class group. It's, the, it's, in, it's incredible politics. It's outstanding politics. It's soaring politics that created the idea of India. And it's, it's been ruined a great deal by lousy politics. If it has to be reclaimed, it has to be reclaimed by great politics. And at the heart of all politics is the idea of power men who will wield power and how they will wield power. And so as a writer and as a journalist, it's what fascinates me above all, the nature of power, how power, uh, 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 how power impacts those who wield it and those it's wielded against. And, and so, I mean, the story of my assassins, including the little meditation that uh, 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 Manu just read out, mentally are examinations of, of, of power and its, and, and its various pathologies and manifestations. <clears throat> Uh, there was a time after, after Operation West End when uh, four out of seven directors of Tehelka were actually out on bail. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the other three were Naipaul, Amitabh Bachchan and Kushwan Singh. <laughs> uh, all the four working journalists associated with Tehelka uh, faced the threat of arrest. Tarun, can you take us through those dark days? Now, wh what did they do to you? I mean, it's, it's impossible to recapture those days, but I'll, I'll tell you something. It's, it's a very peculiar thing. Doing right also has a kind of splendor to it, which, which, we were, we, which we were the recipients of. So while there was this incredible onslaught by the state, uh, uh, two things had happened after we broke the story. One, we became heroes overnight, and so every bus conductor and every waiter in a restaurant recognized us and said good things about us. Uh, the other was that even while every CEO of the country thought, thought we were wonderful and every bus driver thought we were wonderful, nobody wanted to formally associate with us. So everybody was terrified of the state, because by then the state had begun to unleash its arts so we found ourselves in a very peculiar place. We found a great deal of acclaim and goodwill coming towards us and also a great deal of fear. And that's when I began to understand what a crippling thing fear is. I remember the precise moment I crossed the line of fear myself and I also discovered that fear is finally only a line in your own head. It's not a line on the ground. For us, has to really cross the line inside our own heads where, where we are made afraid. And, and I think the, the latter half of that particular meditation that Manu just read is about fear. And the thing is, the, the important thing I discovered very quickly as the state began to hit us was that never, not for a moment, must I show fear in my eyes. I understood fundamentally that power feeds, oppression feeds on fear. The more afraid you are, the more oppressive the, the, the antirrhinical power becomes. And so through those years, as we fought the state, uh, just a few of us, uh, day in and day out. But the one thing that at no point must I ever look afraid. Whether I was on television, in public, speaking to anyone, I knew if, if I became afraid, I knew the state would completely crush us. And we were shut down. We were a group of 120 people. We came down to four people. Uh, we, we, we were in, embroiled in an extraordinary exercise, which was the Venkat Swami Commission of Inquiry, which was instituted by the state not to look into the corruptions we had revealed, but its primary purpose began, became to look into who we were and why, why we had uh, uh, done this expose. Those uh, months and years, I think we were accused of everything. I mean, the government propaganda machine worked over time. We were accused of being Dawood Ibrahim's men. We were accused of being ISI agents. We were accused of being Congress stooges. Hindujas, or we were accused of being on the Hindujas payroll. Every day, the state would plant a new false story on us. When we went into the Commission of Inquiry, which is quite a grand affair, actually, I must say, it's not like a usual court. It's a beautiful air-conditioned hall with a judge sitting out there, and pretty much pretty cinematic. It was quite impressive, I must say. So when we went into this Commission of Inquiry, the, the state filed affidavit after affidavit against us where not a single word was true. There were just falsehood after falsehood being filed against us. The, 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 the Solicitor General of India and, and the Attorney General of India would come into the courtroom and, te and, and, and tell lies about us. And every day we would go into that particular Venkat Swami Commission of Inquiry courtroom. And there would be seven or eight of Tehelka's lawyers at one end and 200 lawyers of all the guys we had exposed at the other end. This is the rub. We had some of the most incredible lawyers fighting it out for us. It's in those years that I also discovered how so much of Indian democracy, I think I say it in, 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 in the story of my assassins, that if you haven't visited a lower court in India, you don't know a damn about Indian democracy. You want to know what Indian democracy is about? Visit a lower court and you'll know what, it was, what, what it's really about. And we had some of the greatest lawyers in India step out to, to, to defend us pro bono, Ramjet Malani, Shanti Bhushan, Prashant Bhushan, Rajiv Dhawan, Kapil Sibbal. Top lawyer after top lawyer stepped out 
and, and defended us completely pro bono. And, and that, that was the upside of the story. The downsides are endless. I mean, I can go on and on. Like I said, the, those years were so dark, it's difficult to recapture them, and I don't care to recapture them. But the upsides were quite spectacular. The upsides were the public goodwill. The upsides were the sheer courage and, 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 and glorious kind of um, um, uh, generosity of the, of the finest lawyers of India who came forward. I think what was disappointing actually was Indian media. I mean, I, I remember I used to call up friends, editors and, and publishers who were friends of mine, and I used to tell them, don't, don't take our side because I know you and you're a friend of mine. Just look at the facts. Will you just get your reporters to look at the facts? I mean, I, used, I would keep asking the same thing. Because these were just falsities being planted again and again, which is one reason why at Tehilka, when we finally managed to come back after years of struggle, we finally came back through an extraordinary campaign where we collected advanced subscriptions uh, from the people. For nine months, I went up and down the country. After we, call, after we walked out of the Venkat Swami Commission, finally at a, a point came when I issued a statement saying we would not participate anymore in this, in this victimization of ourselves. And so we walked out, the commissions finally collapsed, uh, and then I started the hunt to come back. Because by then I began to feel that it was no longer about Tehelka and it was no longer about Tarun Tejpal. The, uh, the story of Tehelka had become yoked to something far, far bigger. I fundamentally began to think that if Tehelka did not come back, then the message that would go out is, you do the right thing and you'll be rendered extinct for it. I felt if somehow I could bring Tehelka back, because we were shut by then, we were just waging these public battles every day. If somehow I could bring Tehelka back, then the message would go out, you do the right thing, you may have to pay a heavy price for it, but you can still win. And so I became obsessed with bringing Tehelka back. For nine months, I traveled up and down the uh, country. I would get friends of mine to get together any group of people. And there are probably friends sitting in this audience who put together groups of people for me. And I would just go and address them, five people, 10 people, 50 people, 500 people, with a very simple message saying, You've seen the story of Tehelka, you've seen what we did, you've seen what happened to us. All I'm asking you to do is be a good citizen and take a subscription application that we are going to launch, an advanced subscription. And it's, it's amazing that close to 15,000 Indians wrote up checks for, for advanced subscribing to a magazine that may never have come. And finally, I put together a new team. We were only four people. We put together a fresh team of journalists. This team was actually, now we were at the end of 2003, this team was about 10 times better than my old team, and by now we had become iconic. So for journalists, it was very exciting to work for us. We put the team together. We found a new office. I'd been officing out of a friend's uh, uh, home in the, uh, in the friend's office in the South Extension village at the back of South Extension together. Uh, and then when it came time to launch it, I, I, I discovered when I'd done all the numbers, I'd put the office together, got the new team on, and done all the numbers, I had only enough money. I can talk about it now because it's so far behind. I had only enough money left to bring out week one and week two. So there was only enough money for two issues of Tehelka. I just held my nerve. I told Shoma and Nina, two of the people who had been with me throughout this battle all these years, I told both of them, we're going ahead with it. Nobody else knew. I didn't tell anyone. The whole office was in place. And we, we set a date. We couldn't keep the date. It was in, at the end of November. We set another date, which was actually six, 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 seven years ago now, January 30th. And, and in the peculiar way that the universe will smile on you, you know, beneficently, munificently, you know, when, uh, every now and then, just a week before we were, we were to bring out a first edition of the Helka, this young couple walked into my office. They had written to Nina on the email. They said they were great admirers of me and what we had done. And they, were, they wanted to take a small investment in the Helka. It's truly serendipity. This young couple came. They had made their money on the stock markets and in, in, in early business. Uh, and, and they picked a 5% of our company. And suddenly, they gave us enough money to last four months. And that's roughly how we've, we've gone on for years. I mean, Tehelka could, could have closed down, I'd say, about 200 times in the last seven years. We've been on the brink of closure almost every third week. But somehow or the other, there's always, we've always managed to find some investor, find some money, and keep going on. Uh, the darkest period post the launch of Telka, of course, was when we did our Gujarat expose uh, in 2007, October. I had been at work for nine months, closing an uh, investment with two American funds. We invest $5 million into Telka. We had done everything. We had signed off. The contracts were done. The, uh, it, it, uh, investment in media requires FIPB clearance, Foreign Investment Promotion Board clearance, and seven ministries have to sign off on it. Five ministries had already signed off on it. And then on October, October 25th, we broke the, our, our big story on the 
killings in, in Gujarat, the Gujarat riots. Though, in, incidentally, all those tapes that, that we then showed have been used for the last two years by the special investigation team of the Supreme Court uh, in, its, in its investigations. And I remember the night before we were to break the story, Nina came to me in my room and said, so what do you think? Do you think these guys will get jittery and pull out if you break this story? And I said, it's just too bad. I mean, if, if, that's, if, if, if they will pull out, they will pull out. But we are not going to not break this story because everything we've done so far, all the battles we fought, have been aimed at arriving at a place where we can do stories like this. If we can't do this, it's no point going on. And I have to say, I mean, I, I wish Nina had been proved wrong, but she was proved right. We broke the story. The story created a storm. As I told you, all the tapes are now being used by the Supreme Court in their investigations. But uh, six weeks later, one fund pulled out. And, and two days later, the second fund pulled out. And that particular month, December 2007, and we came the closest to closing in the last five years. I think we gave our salaries at the end of the month. No mind and said, take a little stake in my company, put in a bit of money. And he, took, he, he put in a crore of rupees and gave us a stake, and we could pay our salaries. So it's been like that. But the good news is, and the bad news for many is, that finally we are stable. We have very stable investors. And we're going to be around for a long time doing what we're doing. <clears throat> The Helka has indeed survived. In fact, it is the second most uh, exciting magazine in India. Uh, the, uh, thank you. <laughs> this is the problem. This all this marketing and art sale is what we can't get right. <laughs> oh. Now, uh, Tarun, whether you like it or not, you are perceived as an activist. Uh, but activists as writers, now, isn't that a trap? Because there is something that is important. And then there is something that is interesting. Uh, sometimes what is important is not interesting. So well, what are your answers? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be called an activist. I'm pretty clear. I, I don't think journalism is a kind of a, a, a neutral business. I mean, I think if you're not engaged today in, in a country like India and journalism, you're problematic. You're just, a, you're just selling words and paper. You're doing nothing. I think in a country like India, at this point of its history, you, you, every citizen who holds any area of privilege needs to be engaged. And as a writer, as I said, as, a, as I'm very different as a writer uh, than I am as a journalist, but even as a writer, I hope my politics is always visible through, this, through the kind of cacophony of voices and, and scapes that my novels draw. Activism, I, I think it's a problem when a society begins to believe, and a society as complex and beleaguered as India begins to believe that activism is a pejorative word. I think activism is a highly, highly laudable word. I, I, I admire those among my group who are actually active in trying to bring change, in trying to re reduce the kind of in incredible inequalities and injustices of India. As a magazine, and as, and as all my colleagues in Telka will tell you, and I think all of them will tell you exactly the same, what, what point of view we represent, who we stand for, what we, what we fight for every day, I can tell you very clearly, Manu, I, I am not interested. I've done that sort of journalism in my early years. I'm not interested in doing the beautiful descriptive journalism. I mean, that is for other people to do, and I'm not knocking it. I'm happy people do it. But I don't have the kind of, you know, uh, uh, I don't have the palate to do that anymore. I mean, I, I, Telka is constantly entrenched in its battles, and I'm happy about that. There are two major narratives, I think, in, for the last seven years where Telka has been deeply embedded. Uh, and uh, tomorrow, if Telga closes down tomorrow, I will go home happy that the last 10 years of my life have been well spent. Uh, one is the, the Muslim question. I think Telga has done relentless work on the Muslim question. I mean, we, ent we entered that narrative about five years ago, and over a series of exposes and framework uh, narratives, we've, we've tried to understand why is it that the Muslim feels, uh, uh, feels marginalized and prejudiced in India. And I can tell you, a lot of our work has had a huge impact on policy making. I'm pretty clear, and I think many of my colleagues might be here right now, I tell them again and again, my job as, as an editor and our job as journalists at the end of the day is not to access and reach millions of readers, which, which, which we'll never do. You edit a magazine yourself, you know the exact numbers of people you reach. I know the number of people that I directly reach. I know what my job as an editor is. My job is simply to impact policy and decision makers. I'm telling you very clearly. My job is to actually make sure that those who take decisions 
which impact tens of millions of people uh, or take decisions uh, in a way that is kind of uh, 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 good for the uh, uh, greater public. Uh, even if you and I broke the records of publication selling in India, we would not be able to address more than half a million or a million readers. In a country of a billion, 200 million people, what is half a million readers? It's nothing, it's not even really a drop in the ocean. But the men we wish to impact, which is, as I said, policy makers and decision makers, each of those guys, each of my political friends, when they take a political decision, impact tens of millions of people. If we can get them to behave, I think our job is to persuade them, shame them, do whatever we can to ensure that they behave in a way that impacts the greatest good of the greatest number of people. And in doing that, uh, we, we understand that our, 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 the stories we pick, I think the biggest challenge in journalism, you are an editor and I suppose you face the challenge yourself, but for me, if, for any editor I would imagine the greatest challenge is to pick and allocate space and, 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 and time to stories. We all have very finite resources. In Telka, we have very finite resources. We decide what we are going to put our human and financial resource behind.